Welcome to another in the series of virtual walks around Great Yarmouth and Galston. Our virtual walk this time takes us back to Galston where we will take a few twists and turns through the streets and roads looking at their names and their origins. This follows a similar walk in the series that took us along some of the Great Yarmouth roads and the format here is much the same. As with the Yarmouth walk, the route will be largely along those roads with older and perhaps more unusual origins. The starting point for our walk is the western end of Manby Road, where it joins with Beckles Road. From here we will walk eastwards towards Burnt Lane. Manby Road takes its name from Captain George Manby, who for a time was the master of the Yarmouth Barracks. These were roughly where the current Sainsbury's supermarket is situated. Manby's home was in High Road, Galston, where he died in 1854, aged 88. In 1807, after witnessing the HMS Snipe run aground off Great Yarmouth, he invented the Manby Mortar, later developing into the Breacher's Boy. He'd been deeply affected by the loss of 214 lives from the ship, and his invention of a rocket-based lifeline went on to be the saviour of thousands. We reach the end of Manby Road and join Burnt Lane, which is reference to a pre-1538 major fire of the St Augustine House Priory. The next comparable fire in this area didn't occur until 1981, when the maltings were totally gutted. A little way along Burnt Lane, we turn left and meet with Addison Road. Originally, this road was Clarence Road, but was later renamed Addison after Commander Addison Williamson who owned a distinctive residence on High Road known as Kulunga. The house was inherited by Commander Williamson from Mrs Garnham, who was the daughter of Commander George Williamson. Addison took a huge interest in the Scouts, the British Legion and the Cottage Hospital during World War II. The house was originally called Hill House but later became a landship and was renamed HMS Kulunga and used for training. The right turn from Addison Road brings us to Garnham Road, a name mentioned just a few moments ago. This road is named after Captain John Garnham, as he was known locally, a Royal Navy officer and the man who had Hill House or Kulunga built in 1826. He served on various ships but was taken prisoner in 1814 during the Napoleonic War, later returning as a hero to England through prisoner exchange. In 1815 he was honoured with the rank of lieutenant. He died in 1845 at the age of 92. From Garnham Road we turn into Church Road for a short distance, soon arriving at Frederick Road, and then Danby Road, which in turn leads to Colum Road. In the mid to late 1800s, Frederick Danby Palmer was the owner of a large estate here, and in the 1880s, Frederick Road, Danby Road and Palmer Road took his three names. He was elected as mayor in 1888. The left turn into Column Road will take us back to Church Road. During the time of the Gladstone Parliament, the MP for Great Yarmouth and surrounding area was Sir John Colum, the road being named in his honour. He was a national figure 
and trained at the Royal Naval College and wrote several books relating to British colonies and the Empire. Born on the Isle of Man, he ended his days at the age of 71 in 1909 at his home in London. Walking eastwards along Column Road, we soon join back with Church Road where we cross over and after turning right find Priory Street. Priory Street is from exactly what you would expect, there having been a Priory in this area some time ago. Augustinian friars established the Priory during the reign of Edward I and when this street was first constructed in the 1860s it was named New Street but it was changed soon after in the early 1870s to Priory Street. Heading towards the High Street, we pass the entrance to Conway Road on our left. Farrah Conway was the town clerk of Great Yarmouth from 1937 until 1961. And so we reach the High Street where we turn right and walk a few paces to find Duke Road on our right. This was originally Duke's Head Lane, after the public house on the corner where it met the High Street. Residents of the area considered the connection with the public house to be detrimental to their neighbourhood, and so petitioned the council for a change of name, resulting in Duke Road, and the narrow passage opposite is still sometimes referred to as Duke Lane on some maps. Walking further along the High Street, the next road on our right is Cross Road. In 1813, under the Galston Enclosure Act, the land around here belonged to William Cross. A tithe list of 1842 lists him as the owner. In the late 1890s, William Cross sold his land for building and the road name remains in his honour. We pass the end of Palmer Road mentioned earlier and arrive outside the Feathers public house. The triangular area here was once used as a small marketplace and was given the name of Feathers Plain after the old inn. The word plain is from the Latin word planum and means a flat and level open space. Great Yarmouth has several of these, such as Brewery Plain, Theatre Plain and Church Plain. At Feathers Plain a left turn will take us into Baker Street, reaching as far as the riverside. This is not directly related to any bakery or baker in the bread and pastry sense, but to John Baker, who came into possession of the manor house and brewery that was situated near the eastern end of the road. Originally, the properties were owned by the Killett family until around 1670. Walking towards the riverside, we will come across Bell's Marsh Road on our right. On the death of John Baker, the brewery an extensive land in and around this area became the property of John Baker Bell and included land stretching northwards that was partly marshy. A road was constructed over this area in 1874 and thus became Bell's Marsh Road. At the end of Bell's Marsh Road, a right turn a few paces and then a left turn will take us to the unusual junction of Beach Road and Cliff Hill. We will take Cliff Hill as our choice. Cliff Hill is lined with old, quaint and attractive properties and has had a number of names over the years. At the top of the hill, just before reaching the sharp right turn at the Cliff Hotel, there are steps opposite what was the old White Lion Tavern and which drop down to Beach Road. To the right of the steps is a flat area 
where a defending cannon was sighted, and which gave rise to the hill being named Battery Hill. It has also been Dead Man's Hill, Prospect Hill and Pier Cliff Road before finally becoming Cliff Hill. As we approach the sharp right turn at the Cliff Hotel, we pass on the left a part of the original Cliff Hotel that was destroyed by fire on Boxing Day 1915. The building we're passing is the old stabling block for the horse transport of the time. At the sharp left turn before reaching Marine Parade, we find ourselves opposite the end of Springfield Road. Writings by Arthur Eccleston, Mayor of the Town in 1965, tell us that at the beginning of the 19th century, a large number of emigrant ships sailed between Great Yarmouth and New Orleans in America. There are numerous towns in the United States that go by the name of Springfield, and it is thought that the road is an acknowledgement of these many townships, although there is no clear evidence of this. Passing the end of Springfield Road and taking another sharp right turn brings us to the end of Avondale Road, and then a little further to Clarence Road. These two roads are linked to just one person, who was the grandson of Queen Victoria. He was given the titles of Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence and Avondale. He was the son of Alexandra and Edward, the Princess and Prince of Wales, but died before his father, later Edward VII, and grandmother Queen Victoria, so never becoming king. He was just 28 when he died at Sandringham from pneumonia during a flu epidemic in January 1892. And so we reach the end of the walk, but we'll finish with one or two individual explanations of names that couldn't be covered during the walk route. One of the more unusual roads is Limmer Road that runs between Beach Road and Pavilion Road. For 34 years between 1840 and 1874, John Limmer would use his horse-drawn transport to carry goods twice each day between his hometown of Galston and Great Yarmouth. The road was named Limmer in his honour, and his business was known as the Limmer Express. If you lived in Oxford, you would probably say Maudlin, but locally the name of the council estate is more usually pronounced Magdalen. One of the roads running through the estate is Fastolf Avenue, and it was Sir John Fastolf of Caister Castle who owned the land now occupied by the Magdalen and Shrublands estates. The Shrublands estate was laid out following World War II, and all the road names are simply the names of trees or shrubs. The estate is bordered by Crab Lane, which may well have been the catalyst for Shrublands road names, as it was a country lane that was lined with crab apple trees and is not connected to crabs from the sea. The second estate of Magdalen has most of the road names taken from those of Oxford University Colleges. We will end the road name tour with that of Morton Pito Road at the edge of Galston where it joins with Bradwell. Samuel Morton Pito was an entrepreneur and civil engineer born in 1809 in Surrey. He was an MP and managed construction firms that built amongst other major structures Nelson's Column in Trafalgar Square and the current Houses of Parliament. He also had a significant interest in the Great Western Railway. In 1844 he bought Summerleyton Hall, on which he had major rebuilding carried out, and his company built 
many of the houses and a school within the village. By 1860 his business interests were in trouble and he sold Summerleyton Hall, becoming bankrupt in 1866. He never properly recovered from his downfall and died in obscurity in 1889, but his local connection and major civil engineering accomplishments remain honoured in the name of Morton Pito Road. And so we end our virtual wander along some of the roads of Galston and hope that some of the mysteries of the names have been answered. Join a real-life heritage walk with one of our official guides if you can. We would love to see you and hear your stories when the walks are back on the calendar of events.